Hi everyone and welcome to another edition of Head On. We're here today for a really exciting conversation about a very unique application process that's underway here on the island to make this fabulous Salish Sea, this inner wonderful inner ocean that we have in our area, into a UNESCO World Heritage Site. That's a remarkable opportunity for the island. Um, it's the first time in 10 years that UNESCO has opened up the process for applications. And to help us walk through this process tonight, a very interesting project that's underway, is Laurie Gourlay. Welcome. And he is, Laurie, you're the president of the Salish Sea Trust, which yeah. is uh, spearheading this movement for the UNESCO World Heritage designation. And we invite lots of folks to help us with that. Very good. We'll talk about that tonight, how we can get involved. And also joining us is Christina Mittermeyer from the Sea Legacy, which has partnered with the Salish Sea Trust to have this exciting opportunity. Um, just want to let viewers know what a UNESCO uh, World Heritage Site stands for. It's the United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organizations. And uh, there's quite a few of them already in Canada. We'll talk about some of those. But um, when Prime Minister Trudeau was uh, out here in August, he was the one who opened up the process for the UNESCO applications to start flowing through. Also to time for Canada's 150th birthday next year in 2017. So why should we uh, protect this amazing Salish Sea? I would want to set this up for the viewers. Uh, there's a wonderful map that we have here that shows the area of the Salish Sea, which extends from uh, Port, uh, no, Campbell River to the Puget Sound. And we'll get that map up in just one second here. And it's uh, a large part of the Georgia Strait, I and mean, we have it here. That shows the area in context with uh, the continent, and then right here on the island. So it's a very large area. It's about the size of Ireland um, in size. Yeah, it's considerable. Yeah, and there's 8 million people that live in the Salish Sea area, including all of us lucky people here who are that lucky to live here, and over 3,000 different marine species. So, Christina, you're an avid diver, as well as being the president of Sea Legacy, and your husband is a National Geographic photographer. So thank you for providing some of these amazing photographs here that we have this evening. Just speak to what we're looking at here, Christina. Um, you know, I'm a fairly new Canadian and I've been surprised when I arrived here at just the diversity and the beauty of this area. So um, as a diver and a photographer, I've been working all over the world and was just surprised that uh, we really lived in an underwater garden. Uh, for those of us who have the privilege of being divers, you know, sticking your head underwater, it's just looking at an amazing aquarium of biodiversity. We are indeed lucky. And, you know, the, the Salish Sea, of course, supports an uh, incredible amount of wildlife, uh, things like these pink anemone, anemone. And there's areas where the currents pick up that uh, the, the, and everything is covered in life. So barnacles and clams and anemones and octopus. And it, it, in some places, you can't even touch because everything is encrusted with corals and sponges. It's just magnificent and beautiful. And of course, you know, we have very important iconic species like uh, five different species of salmon and we have marine mammals and of course the incredible uh, cultural riches of our First Nation communities. So it really is a remarkable area. And that's a photo of some of the totems, um, the older totems that exist. And that was provided by Cheryl Alexander, another yes, photographer. Another photographer who's uh, collaborating with the Salish Sea Wonderful. Trust. Yeah. So yeah, thank you for those amazing images. Uh, just a really good reminder of what we live around and the amazing beauty that there is there that needs to be preserved, not only for us, uh, for our nation, but for the world itself and for generations to come. I'm going to interrupt just to say, that, uh, well said, but there's also a unique species still being discovered. Just a few years ago, uh, glass sponges were found just off of Gabriola Island and then to the north and, and so on. And so uh, it's still an area where we can go in and find new species. And the glass sponges themselves are uh, some of the oldest uh, living organisms on the planet. Wow. And so we have that in our backyard, you know, and it's something to cherish and be proud of and, and, and to protect. And to protect, exactly. So Lori, how did you come to be involved in the application process for the UNESCO World Heritage De Designation? Well, we've been busy uh, for quite a number of years in terms of looking at the Salish Sea per se, as well as a National Marine Conservation Area reserve around the Gulf Islands that's underway at the moment. Uh, and so uh, in that, we've been talking with 
with different people. And then the prime minister uh, brought this phenomenal offer to the table, and we thought, this is the time to jump in, you know, because there's a lot of development interests here, and there's a lot of needs for protection, and there's a lot of opportunity to try to bring all of those interests together under this umbrella of the World Heritage Site mm -hmm. and address both cultural and natural attributes that we have. Mm -hmm. So we thought, here is an opportunity we're not going to get again, at least for 10 years. Exactly. So let's uh, step forward and, and talk with people and try to work with everyone and see what we can do. So we're just uh, jumping in the deep end, so to Fantastic. speak. And you're going to be collaborating with um, international partners as well, because obviously Puget Sound area goes into Washington State. So there's exciting um, collaborations to have there with our, our U.S. Uh, counterparts, as well as a lot of First Nations um, involvement as well, I would think, for the, the cultural diversity here that uh, this area represents. Very, very, very deep roots here. For our oh, oh, 5,000, 8,000 years to go back to the glaciers for the First Nations. So uh, very important to have their involvement and support. And we're a actively reaching out and seeing what we can do to work together to meet both interests. And of course, the same across transboundary into the state of Washington, trying to make those overtures, seeing what they're doing, because a lot of good work's done there. And a lot of money has been uh, spent by the U.S. government, some $650 million just uh, dedicated to the health and productivity in the Puget Sound. Mm -hmm. And we would like to see the Canadian government step up to the plate and give similarly. You know, and then we can work across the boundaries um, and then really establish something that's going to be uh, a legacy for us in 2017, Canada's 150th. Uh, and then we're talking reconciliation and healing as well to tie into both traditional values that the First Nations bring. Absolutely. These are all very, very powerful elements that are coming together for this application. I think there's so many good synergies that, are, um, that this affords and that we can build on. I think this is wonderful. It's exciting. It's, it is very exciting. Yeah. 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 We're, we're so pleased to see the Prime Minister bring this forward mm -hmm. and initiate that discussion. And I think, weren't we talking the 5% marine protected areas for 2017? Yes. Uh, yes, so Canada is a signatory to the Convention on Biological Diversity. And as, the UN Convention. Uh, exactly. Yes. And as yes. such, we, like all the other countries who have signed the convention, have committed to protecting at least 10% of Canada's oceans by 2020. Mm -hmm. uh, as of now, I think we're at the 1% mark. And so we have a lot of terrain to cover. But Prime Minister Trudeau has mandated that by 2017, we should at least be 5% protection. So we're trying to shine a light on the Salish Sea as a beautiful, unique area so that it is considered in that protection. Absolutely. And, yeah, this is the opportunity. I mean, we are a unique inner sea, an mm -hmm. ocean in Canada. Some of the largest uh, estuaries that, that we see around North America. And so we're offering both these species diversity and the culture. We think we've got it all, really. When we yes. look at the World Heritage Site criteria, there's like 10 criteria to be designated as a UNESCO World Heritage Site. You only need one to qualify. We think we have six. Wow. So, uh, we're, you know, it's, it's not a played hand yet, but we're going to be addressing all of those matters and saying, really, this is so important. How can you not declare it? Exactly. Um, and we'll invite the Prime Minister out when he does do that. Wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> so when we get that designation, um, what are the benefits to the local area, to the planet? Uh, what are the benefits to have something designated as a UNESCO World Heritage Site? What would be the advantages here and the benefits? It is such a prestigious thing to be recognized in this yes. way. And when you think about some of the iconic World Heritage Sites in the world, you know, that can be designated either for their uh, universal value in nature or in culture. And in some cases for both, you know, there's a handful of World Heritage Sites that combine these values in nature and culture. And we are lucky here that we can actually propose this natural culture uh, designation. But you think about the pyramids in Egypt or the pyramids in Mexico or uh, the Galapagos Islands. You know, these are all World Heritage Sites that become iconic symbols of culture, nature. And of course, they bring a lot of tourism and a yes. lot of opportunities, a lot of international prestige and recognition. Economic benefits are big, uh, and that's put forward prominently with all of the World Heritage Sites. Here is an opportunity for a sustainable local economy to evolve. Mm -hmm. And you start to bring those interests in, whether it's photographers or divers or uh, people just like to 
float around on their boats, you know, that kind of thing. Whale yeah. watching. Artists, writers. <laughs> Yeah, very poets. much so. And it's yeah. an economy that really it trickles down through the entire you know yeah. society spectrum. So from the moment that tourists arrive, uh, there's opportunities for a lot of economic growth, mm -hmm. and you know we want to promote that, especially in some of the most remote areas in the in the province. You know where there's few economic opportunities, and tourism yes. would bring an incredible solution. And we see, sorry to say, but we see uh, marine protected areas so similar to this then uh, establish a lot of funds uh, coming in from outside because they're then trying to attract more people. Real estate values uh, at least stay equal if not going up mm -hmm. and you're protecting the quality of life that you've come here to enjoy in the first place. So all of the beauty, the health, the... Uh, you know, the good feelings that you have just by living here, you retain that and you're giving it to your children and to the future. It's a, a recognition of something that's important to all of humanity yes. for a World Heritage Site. And so you're trying to put it forward and to, to say, we are proud to be here mm -hmm. and we want to offer it as a gift to the world. A national treasure as a gift to the world. Yes. I love that. Yeah. It, and it's a marine equivalent of the Great Bear Rainforest, mm -hmm. which I think yes. you were also working on, and which was just designated by the Prince and by the Premier and, uh, you know, the Queen's Canopy just uh, recognized mm -hmm. it. So we think we have exactly the same attributes and the special benefits that we would find through the Great Bear Rainforest right here. Mm -hmm. It's just we haven't yet realized it and worked together to achieve it. So. It's tr a tremendous opportunity. And I just want to just let viewers know about some of the, the World Heritage Sites that we do have here in Canada um, that they know, may not know about. And I know a lot of people um, are um, UNESCO World Heritage um, groupies or junkies, <laughs> shall we say. They make travel out of seeking out these sites, you know, particularly because of their prestigious designation. So the Canadian Rocky Mountain Parks uh, were designated in 1984. Dinosaur Provincial Park in Alberta was designated in 79. Grossmoor National Park in Newfoundland, that was 1987. And uh, Mistaken Point, again on the East Coast, 2016. Nahani National Park. Uh, and Waterton Gla Glacier National Park and Wood Buffalo National Park. Those are all some of the UNESCO Can ones. I add one there? You certainly may. Uh, North Coast uh, with the Haida Gwaii, uh, Skangwe, you know. Uh, so they've already got World Heritage status uh, in the tentative list. And so we're working with First Nations there, marine environment. It's almost a duplicate, really. And uh, with the new Marine Area Protection Plan that's going forward with First Nations, there's a chance to protect a lot of the coast on the west side of Canada and to really respect you know what natural cultural boundaries can do and and contribute to both the economy and you know the future and so on so um, is there a lot of cost involved in, in making the application for this is is what what is involved when you decide we're going to apply um, I mean, is this a written report this thick that you submit? Is it videos? Is it um, testimonials? All, a little, all of that, you know. Yeah. Um, so you have to fill out the form according to the requirements and the like. And that means that you have to prove the outstanding universal values that are in the area, the significant historical, natural, and cultural attributes or heritage that we have. And so you're going through, in a way, both the general uh, attributes you've got as well as the specific areas. What have we got here? What have we got there and why does that all add up to something with outstanding universal value that we'll all want to protect and love and you know uh, see our children enjoy. Yes. Um, so you are filling out those scientific reports that are looking at it and then you're looking at uh, the the words, the praise that are coming forward from everyone. I mean, we'd like individuals to say if they support us, to send us a letter that way, we will submit that as well. But it's each sectoral area across the board, whether it's industry, business, commerce, mm -hmm. government, and the like, all of those are important because they all have a different way of saying why they think the Sealish Sea is important. And, uh, it, you know, uh, we go out for a lunch or a, a sail and we think, oh, this is great. This is why the sail is important. But the divers have a different idea, mm -hmm. you know, and government thinks, well, we want to save those special species and, and the like. And so uh, it's really adding all of that together and then putting it forward. And then this uh, body will review it and assess it. Um, there's a couple of bodies 
ICMOS, the International Council on Monument Sites that uh, review the cultural, and then there's the International Union of Conservation and Nature and Natural Resources that looks at that natural site. And they both will review and assess and say, yes, this is important, or, or no, you know, this is a falsified. No, they won't say that. We won't falsify any no. of it. Uh, <laughs> but so they'll assess it, essentially, and it goes forward. So the, you started the process in September, and the application has to be in, at, or at least this stage of the application, in by the end of January. How, how are you on your timeline? Is that going to be met? So we're, we're, we're right on the mark. Uh, right. Um, so we've been gathering the material, making the outreach. We've got conversations with the different bodies who are going to be assessing, and they're giving us some advice and review. And we're collecting a lot of information at this point, and then it's a matter of you know sitting down over Christmas and yeah. writing up a lot of things that are going Dear to be Santa, there. <laughs> we want a UNESCO designation for the Salish Sea. And we'd like a New Year's resolution from everyone. Write us a letter, say why you think it's important, send us a picture, you know, that would be a great thing. Brilliant segue. How can viewers get involved? I'm sure people will be fiercely interested in this. They probably don't know this process is underway. And how can we help? Um, what can we do? Well, we do really want your personal thoughts, you know, what you think is important, because that will add up a great deal. Whoever you are, you know, just tell us why you think it's important, so why you'd like to see it. So we website, salishseatrust.ca. There's a, a place there where we can... Um, address mm -hmm. and the like, and we've got a new booklet that's coming out, about 32 pages with a lot of pictures from Christina and Paul Nicklin, and uh, we'll be... Uh, that'll give you a good background on both the World Heritage Site, what it means, the criteria and so on, give an introduction so you it's good reading over Christmas, mm -hmm. and then uh, send us your letters. But you can also talk to your representatives, you know, at the local government level and, and your friends and family and say, you know, this is happening once every 10 years we get this chance, now is the time, you know, because what will happen over the next 10 years um, World Heritage Site is also looking at climate change and we're noting it's going to be raising that sea level one meter, two meter, four meters, some people are saying by 2050. So uh, it's going to be a changing sea and we need to be attending to that sooner than later and the World Heritage Site wants to address that. That's a special thing. And so here is an opportunity for us to get ahead of the game and start looking at that and cooperating across the border. You know, there's more and more talk of how do we share the sea, how do we work together with all interests and really, you know, protect historical, cultural, natural sites. Now, ears perked up when you mentioned the book that's coming out with the amazing uh, photographs from Christina and her husband. Yeah. Christina, when will that book be available and how is it going to be utilized in terms of this process? You know, Paul Nicklin and I, my husband and I, we have a small nonprofit organization called Sea Legacy and the mandate of that organization is to partner with other NGOs and initiatives like uh, the Salish Sea Trust to shine a light and to really make people aware of the beauty and really to propel these efforts with beautiful imagery. The images that we've donated to the Salish Sea Trust are being right now designed into this booklet, which I think is going to be a digital product that anybody okay. will have access yes. to. Very good. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And it's Exactly. Yeah. It's an, it's an <laughs> You know, I think for, for me that the thing that people can really do is just start being really proud of the fact that we're all part of the Salish Sea. I think a lot of people yes. don't even know that we are the Salish Sea, all of us, all 8 million people around this incredible well, inner sea. Being surprised by how lucky we are living here, you know. Yes. Well, yes, I am living beside a World Heritage Site, something that's significant that people from around the world want to come to visit. You know, we see the New York Times, People's Magazine, mm -hmm. and so on, uh, and the yachting circles as well. They're all saying, "Come here, you know, enjoy it. It's mm -hmm. the best place to go." And so, you know, we just haven't realized how lucky we are, and this yeah. is an opportunity to recognize it. Now, if there's diving groups out there, if there's um, boating groups. Um, uh, artists, writers, um, they can all get Fishermen, behind this as well. Fishermen. Yes. All of the stakeholders, anybody, I think yeah. all of us, you know, we take it a little bit for granted, but we all really depend on the health and, and beauty of this, of this coastline. Uh, whether you're a fisherman, whether you, you know, commute to work by boat, or you're a diver, a photographer, a whale watcher, a bear guide. Yes. Uh, there's so many jobs that depend on the, on the healthy and bounty of our natural resources here. 
and I, I feel like uh, uh, as a province, you know, we are at a crossroads where we have to make a decision. Are we going to go the industrial pathway or are we really going to be supernatural British Columbia and develop an economy that's long lasting, sustainable for generations to come on the, on the values that we came here for initially, I think. So it's a, it's a beautiful moment for us to really, and the, and the World Heritage Site application, and if hopefully we get the designation, provides us with a lens and that we can look at, at this development and make decisions going forward. Mm -hmm. um, I think it would be incredibly valuable. Could I add, perfect uh, to say, uh, sustainable development. Uh, 2017 is also the 30th anniversary of the Brundtland Commission report, Our Common Future, which looked at the economy and environment while we balance it, which is the Prime Minister always raising that's what his goal is. So here we have the opportunity with a 30th anniversary right here on the tw uh, 2017 150th anniversary of Canada, and it also is the 10th anniversary of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People coming up in 2017. So all of those things are here and all of them are important to the Salish Sea. And it's, so it's a chance to celebrate, to recognize and you know, to really uh, take note of what we have and, and try to protect and preserve it for the future under that umbrella of the World Heritage Site. Very good. And what has been the um, involvement of First Nations um, in the last few months in this application process? And how do you see their involvement um, going forward as well? We put out uh, suggestions, uh, we'd like to do this, uh, and invited response. Mm -hmm. And we've heard just in the last couple of days from the Assembly of First Nations who are meeting in Ottawa at this point, mm -hmm. uh, an interest in a proposal that we have uh, going into the anniversary, the 10th anniversary and so on in the fall. And they're talking about UN processes and how much they uh, reflect and complement the traditional values of the First Nations. And so the two go hand in hand. And some of the, some of the discussion over the last couple of days was that um, both uh, human values, human rights, as well as democracy are furthered by looking at uh, UN processes and the aspirations that they have for you know, the larger planet and all of the peoples here. And so that complements what the First Nations are doing and we're suggesting to them, here's an opportunity to you know, really uh, protect a lot of the values, both natural and cultural. And so we are hopeful that we'll see uh, that partnership develop further. At this point, it's one of inviting all interests in, and uh, we don't mean to speak for First Nations in any way. It's a, a careful walk, but there's the consultation and the opportunity to partner, and we think everything is moving smoothly forward. Yeah. On a more informal note, you know, uh, I have a lot of friends in the First Nations communities, and uh, there's this great interest in using the beauty and, the, and the, you know, the, the tradition, the natural resources, as the base of an alternative economy. And so you see it in communities like uh, Clem Two, where it's so much of the, the, so many of the jobs are based on tourism, based on nature. And I think there's a great interest and pride in those right. natural resources. And so we hope that we will get lots of support. Mm -hmm. This is the opportunity for reconciliation and hearing. This could be a model for that across the country. And UNESCO uh, has also said under the World Heritage Site that this is a goal that they have. They want to see more indigenous partnerships in uh, de declaring and recognizing World Heritage Sites. So it seems, as so has um, the IUCN, uh, International Union of Conservation of Nature, just this summer also came forward very much said, these natural sites and the cultural sites, we need to start working with the indigenous people, the traditional wisdom, you know, the tools and knowledge that they bring forward, and how do we blend all of that, you know, to create that partnership. So we're very, uh, we're excited across the board. It's, yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, yeah I, I'm going to jump right up here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's it's wonderful to see these these partnerships beginning to take place. Uh, you know, cross. Do you have any American people working with you yet yes, on that as well? Um, I just met this last week with Bert Weber. He's a professor at Western Washington University, and he's actually the fellow who uh, brought forward the name Salish Sea um, and put it forward, and the Coast Salish. Uh, named it or declared it in 2010. So uh, we're working with them, the Salish Sea Institute. We talked with the Pacific Biological Station here. There's interest in cross-border studies that are coming forward. And there's a number of organizations that we're talking with in the states as well. 
And uh, we plan on reaching yeah. out to uh, Governor Inslee as well because he yes. is a great conservationist and advocate for protection, and we're going to begin those conversations in earnest uh, in the new year. Yes. Has the Premier been involved yet in any discussions with, with uh, Sailor Sea Trust? Good question. We, yes, we made an overture, to, mm -hmm. and uh, we're, we are actually in an exchange with the Intergovernmental Secretariat at this point with the Cascadia Innovation Corridor because we have a website application they're called the Sailor Sea Roundtable that's very innovative, and we expect it to be exportable around marine protected areas. And so uh, Bill Gates was at this Cascadia Innovation Corridor, and we said we should be at the table with Bill, and we should be talking about what we can do because we're coming at it from a nonprofit opportunity to bring this information forward with this new website. And so we think uh, there is a great deal of interest from the states and from the Premier's office in this. Wonderful. I'm sure if we can get Bill Gates, we'll be able to get Christy. What do you think? Well, I'm <laughs> hoping uh, indeed, <laughs> yes. <laughs> It's a great opportunity in so many different ways, and that's what we're seeing, all the different sectors and interests. And so we're, you know, we're trying to see what we can do to encourage and excite others, mm -hmm. get them involved, and give them an opportunity to say what they think and what they love about the Salish Sea. Fantastic. And I mean, there's so many things to say and love about this uh, Salish Sea area. So next steps, Lori and Christina, the application goes in the end of January, and then what happens? It's a long consultation process that begins with a commission that reviews the application and then they will be re requiring new materials mm -hmm. and we can also offer new materials so we hope that there's going to be a lot of involvement from everybody uh, in sending us their further have, thoughts. Yeah. Sorry, we have till April to get letters of support in so uh, we'll keep, continue to invite that. And then as I was mentioning with the Salish Sea Institute forum and study going into the fall, we're going to continue that conversation, try to create the, the networking and the information sharing because uh, new species being found and there's that yes. discussions, how do we protect uh, both the areas, the historical, natural, cultural areas, and then how do we work together, you know, share that information and, and respect each other's interests in this, you know? So yes. all of that still needs to be worked out, so to speak. Very good. A lot well, of excitement. this has been uh, the initial conversation on this uh, incredible process that's happening right here in our own communities. And we look forward to having you back again to, ha to have updates on this application process because yes, yes. I understand it could take several years before this is actually <clears throat> finalized. Yes. So there's a lot of opportunities for our viewers to get involved. They can hop on your website, sailorseatrust.ca and sealegacy.com as well uh, to get more information, how they can get involved, um, how they can um, participate in this very exciting process here that's happening on the island. So thank you so much for coming in. I wish you all the best, thank and you. I look forward to uh, putting my uh, words in as well of support on this very exciting project. Thank you very and much. And thank you for watching tonight. And if you want to get involved as well, the websites and the phone numbers are there on the screen for the Sailor Sea uh, Trust. Uh, so thank you so much for and, uh, joining us this evening. And if you have any show ideas or comments or questions, please feel free to come to Annette Lucas and her email is there at the bottom of the screen. And we'll see you next time on Head On. Thank you.